remember the first time that I realized that humanity's desire for luxury was actually a driving force for improving the world. Previous to that, I had often felt that wanting luxury and comfort was wrong or bad, perhaps from generations of Puritanism passed down through religion and culture. But as I lay in the comfort of a luxurious hotel room, feeling perfectly at home, I finally understood that this desire was a positive thing. Without a woman's desire for indoor plumbing, a comfy bed, and the ease of flipping a switch to produce light or heat, we probably wouldn't be enjoying all of these luxuries right now as a society. It is our innate drive for comfort, aka luxury, that drives human progress. Yet with every strength, there is an inherent weakness. There is a downside to pursuing comfort and luxury at the expense of all else. And it results in us becoming soft and squishy and unable to face the challenges ahead of us. Does that mean we give up our lives of comfort? Perhaps for some, but for all of us, it means that we intentionally add pressure to our lives in a way that strengthens our mental, emotional, and physical muscles, allowing us to, quote, keep our edge and to prepare for the hard times which are coming. If you enjoy this episode or any of our episodes, would you please do us a favor and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or at our website, podcast.extraordinaryfamilylife.com. When you leave us a rating and a review, it helps to make this world a better place by getting this podcast into the ears of more parents. Parents are the molders and shapers of the future generations. We all need all the help we can get to be the best people and the best parents we can. Families with thriving parents raise thriving children who grow up to have a positive impact on their own families and communities, which leads to better nations and a better world. So you can have an impact by taking a minute to share the podcast with someone who will benefit from it and by leaving a rating or review. And make sure to follow us on Instagram if you're not already. You can find us at World School Family or at greg.denny. Thank you so much for listening. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Extraordinary Family Life Podcast. Um, I'm so physically sore and exhausted right now. I'm kind of Hopefully hang- you won't fall asleep while I'm, we're talking. I'm hanging on to my chair. I'm not sleepy. I'm just like, <laughs> I'm spent. I just spent the last four days going through um, what was called a selection training. It was designed by uh, Special Forces guys to test our limits, to push us so hard that we see what we're, what we're made of, which there's a really cool word. It's M-E-T-T-L-E, metal. And it's like, basically, what, what are you made of, right? What's inside? What kind of metal do you have inside of you? And it's, it's that grit. So you have to push those limits. And, and it was awesome, but I'm crazy sore. I even, I even went and got a full deep tissue massage, and our amazing little uh, Chinese masseuse used her elbows and her heels and found every knot in my body, and (laughs) it was painfully magical. Um, But Rachel really wants to talk today about a comment she got on one of her Facebook posts about the earth being flat. Instagram, Facebook stories. Yeah, somebody was like, the earth is a flat disk. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and we I'm not even sure how to respond, respond to that. Actually. Like, I, I know flat earthers exist. So they're out I there. No, I'd never interacted with one. But that's going to have to be another day because... We're going to have to do some homework like we about saying, math and physics. Greg and I were talking amongst ourselves. I mean, we're not smart enough to prove that the earth is round and that the sun is not revolving around the earth. Although the first comment my kids made was, well, how do people circumnavigate the globe and start in Alaska and end up in Alaska heading east if the earth is not round? And I'm like, exactly. Good point. (laughs) But that's not what we're going to talk about today. Today, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to talk about not only handling pressure, but I, I would invite you to pursue pressure. And that might seem counterintuitive. Most of, most of you have a lot going on. Most of the people listening, you guys are high achievers. And you 
the vast majority of you are married, some children, a couple, uh, you know, you got a, a career or a job. Um, or a business. Or a business, you're running a business. See, and some of you have lots career. of employees and multiple businesses and uh, large families or lots of hobbies or lots of projects. Community you, you've got a lot going on. Yeah, you're in your community, church you're in your church, you're... You, you're, you've been invited to be on boards. You're in organizations. You've got a lot going on, and there's a lot of pressure. And I often get asked, like, how do you, how do you handle the pressure? How do you handle the stress? How, how do you do that? And, and what's really interesting, in fact, there was a, I got a book recommendation again. Um, it's called The Comfort Crisis. Have you heard of that one? Mm-hmm. No? So The Comfort Crisis. I've heard I put it on my list a while ago, and then I got recommended again. It's like... That we're in our in our in our time, and this has happened periodically throughout um, history. But in our time again, it's it's kind of shown up that like we're just seeking comfort and convenience. It's like this pursuit to make things comfortable and easy. Well, in some ways, I would think that that's a, that is a part of our nature. We are comfort seeking creatures you know, evolutionarily speaking, because I think that that is what is something that can drive us to improve our lives, improve humanity. Like, I think it's a motivating force for improvement Mm -hmm. in the world because we do seek comfort. In fact, I remember, you know, as you're working through your relationship with money and, and, you know, abundance versus lack. I remember this realization I had one time about this idea that luxury actually drives the improvement of the world. Mm -hmm. Like we have indoor toilets, (laughs) all of us, most of us, not all of us. Because somebody was sick of walking to the outhouse in winter. That was a luxury at one point. It was a luxury to have indoor toilets. But then a luxury becomes... A standard of living and then you know the majority of the people have that and that is that driving force right there is what has driven humanity to improve the world and to make it better and now we have indoor you know we have temperature control heating and air conditioning heated toilet seats and we're, yeah those things are to amazing the <laughs> of heated toilet seats and all these fancy things but it, it comes from this drive we have for comfort which is directly tied to luxury i would say um another thought you know i remember early on in our travels we lived in costa rica in fact our first international experience we lived in costa rica and i remember very specifically we had this really awesome lady that worked for us and she lived with us in our house and this maria maria yeah she was just a she was awesome yeah and we went to go visit her family, and she, her family actually lived All right, like an hour away. Let, hold up, let's let's frame this up. Okay, okay. so we are uh, over. We're we're on t- literally on top of the mountain, like from from almost anywhere in the valley of San Jose, you can see these houses. Like we were renting a place on top of the mountain. It was almost seven thousand yeah, square feet. Yeah, it was absurdly feet. huge. <laughs> it was just massive, fully enclosed, overlooking the whole valley. It was right. just paradise. It was a huge house, yeah, and she amazing. had her own maid like quarters. apartment. It was a little apartment, and and in fact, when she lived with us, I remember she asked you to show her how to use the hot water because she'd yeah. never taken yeah. a shower yeah. with hot water, and so that was like her first experience having a hot for- water shower. I forgot about that. Yeah. And we took her with us to like an all-inclusive resort when I did a triathlon. Yeah. We went down there. And it was like, all so, you can eat food, all this nice stuff. It was awesome. So anyways, back to the story is that we went with her um, one weekend to visit her family. And her family actually lived, I think, an hour or two away. It was probably, it was closer to three or four. And it was down, way down on the Caribbean it was in coast. Limon, on the Caribbean Towards coast. Towards Limon, yeah. Siquires is where she lives. So we went to visit her and... Okay, so we're dropping in elevation. We're dropping. Uh, the temperature no, is rising. Temperature is rising massively. Humidity is rising. Because San Jose, the valley, it's very temperate. It's year round. It's very comfortable. And so we're going down, and we went to her little house, and it was literally very small. Yeah, it, tiny. And it was 
lamina, which is the tin, you know, tin, tin roof, roofs, and then just and just wooden walls. like wooden and slats for wooden the walls. Wooden slats for the walls, and I think the floor was dirt or maybe it was concrete. Um, and I remember sitting there in her house, and we were hanging out and talking to her family. And Aaliyah was a little baby, and she was asleep, and I carried her in and said, is there a bed? And yeah, is there a place the to lay her down? And we went in her bedroom, and it was very rustic. And I remember thinking very specifically, because they had a little, like a little couch chair thing, but it was ripped up and all, you know, broken, and, and they had a couple other chairs. And I remember thinking... There is nowhere in this place to be comfortable, according to my definition, right? I had grown up in America. I was used to soft beds and soft couches and, and like carpet. I was used to comfort. And I remember being so struck by that, that there was nowhere to be comfortable in her house. Not one place. Nothing She invited us to sit down on her couch. Yeah, and it was some. W- it was like springs wooden, and wooden wood boxes. And very... we, yeah, we went to sit down. Like, oh, this hurts. Yeah, it was not comfortable. <laughs> like it was hard to hear, which is and an indication bed, of our our softness. Well, that was the we'll other that. the other realization I had. I'm like, wow, we are very soft. But um, you know, when we went into her beds, first of all, there was like three little beds, and I don't know how many people are in the family. She has seven was, children. Oh yeah, they were in three grandkids. Right. Okay. <laughs> And there was like three beds. Um, but the beds also, they I don't These remember exactly planks, what they were. They weren't plants, mattresses. Yeah. No. They were just like planks or something. Just very keep you off the ground. hard. And so it was very... And she made us the most amazing lunch she did. over an open fire. Yes. Because that's how she cooked. She cooked. And they had like firewood. three glasses and they made some sort of yeah. little juice, and we took turns using the glasses. And they would wash, and utensils and plates. We right. would, we would, we would wash. take turns. And again, she had a big family, but yeah. we would take turns eating because there was only a few utensils and exactly. plates and glasses. Yeah. But Which, I, very... I got to jump ahead so we don't forget <laughs> this. When we left Costa Rica, we gave her our fridge, and we gave her, like, all of our utensils and plates, oh, yeah. and we just all we just right. emptied our kitchen, like... Oh, it was so awesome. She was amazing. And I'm sad we lost contact with her. Yep. But I remember feeling very humbled. And like you were saying, also this feeling of, wow, we're really soft and needy for all these comforts. But also, um, obviously, very grateful. And then later, you know, it was probably years later where I had this realization connected with this idea of luxury and comfort and how that is a driving force that it's it's driving the improvement of the world and ultimately it's bringing people out of poverty the same force because it's lifting the whole it's lifting the whole earth yeah because if you read a book like the rational optimist you see that yeah the world is really way better off and despite all the problems we have and how people like to speak gloom and doom and everything really it's better it's safer we're all wealthier overall, and it's more comfortable. It's it's we're we're healthier. Yep. Really, the world is a way better place than it has ever been. Yep. And then people, um, entire continents like Africa. I was just having a conversation with this when I was I was out uh, rucking over the weekend. We were talking about how Africa is doing a leapfrog again. Mm-hmm. With they did that with the cell phone, right? So. There was no phone lines. Well, there was no internet in Africa. Well, like the was, developing world in general was like that. Yeah, there, just was so they, disconnected from all the technology we had. Yeah, and so technology leapfrogged because they had no phones and they didn't have electricity or whatever, but then all of a sudden cell phone technology is invented and now so they throw, in a very rural area that has no electricity and no um, phone lines, phone lines and no internet, you can now have... Cell service. Yep, exactly. So it's this leap <laughs> and, and a smartphone and access to the internet. Exactly. And the whole rest of the known world. Like when you were hiking through Nepal yeah, and you go to monasteries and the monks have smartphones. I mean, you walk in only. We're days and days of just walking in. And I roll up to this monastery in this cloud forest. There's a monk sitting there on a smartphone scrolling. <laughs> <laughs> what in the world is happening? <laughs> it's amazing. But the same thing's happening now with currency. They were bartering. Like in these yeah. remote villages, they were bartering, and they didn't have a, a monetary system. Mm-hmm. They just t- 
totally did a leapfrog into like cryptocurrency and phone charge ups, like phone right. credit. Now they're exchanging phone credit. Really? So like, oh, you give me a charge. Hey, I'll give you a $10 charge up on your phone if you'll come fix this for me. Boop, boop, boop. And so it has literally become a form of currency. Interesting. Yeah. And so they just, they leapfrog the whole mm-hmm. traditional currency right. thing. So like countries that were so far behind now can jump ahead 50 years mm-hmm. because the new technology just or new ideas just bring it right to them. And so they can right. bypass this long, slow, methodical process that, that other nations went through. It's mm-hmm. like, bloop. So, I mean, there's, there's cool stuff happening around the world like that. Yes. And I love, I love that you're bringing out this point of, like, the pursuit of comfort and luxury is bringing, well, you and I are sitting here in comfortable office chairs in, in my very comfortable, nice office. I have this gorgeous desk here and a huge bookshelf with all my fancy leather books on it. And the, the, the temperature is controlled in here. And I have sound panels on my walls to bring in down the echo and we have these fancy microphones and our smartphones Mm -hmm. we have it all right so all these wonderful things we enjoy are because somebody was pursuing luxury or nice things or improvements or comforts Mm -hmm. but what's the problem then what's the actual crisis and what's what's the downside of comfort and luxury so with every strength you love to say this and with and i i it's powerful i'm like i thought you love to say i do you love to say this (laughs) with every strength there's an inherent weakness and so we've been pointing out the strength of pursuing comfort and improvement making Mm -hmm. our lives better and again man it's hard it's hard to overemphasize that principle we say and again a lot i noticed in our podcast but okay that's a side note We'll keep saying it. And (laughs) And again. again. (laughs) With that elevating force, not just for us as individuals or communities, but like you were pointing out, the whole world gets lifted and and rises Mm -hmm. with improvements, uh, inventions, and those things. But here's the weakness the inherent weakness in the strength is that if we are not very aware very diligent and very deliberate comfort and convenience can make us weak Mm -hmm. and then you you slip into pity parties and you literally find yourself complaining about how slow the wi-fi is on your flight across the ocean Right, And you have to stop and say, wait a minute, I'm flying in this gigantic, well, mostly comfortable hunk That's of debatable. metal. Yeah, it's debatable. <laughs> <laughs> Let's complain about airline sleeps right now. I mean, we're like, we're just, it takes us a, a few hours to get across an ocean or across the continent. It just, it's amazing. The, the flight mm-hmm. is mind-boggling. And we're like, ah, the Wi-Fi is slow. This is terrible. My life's not meant to be this hard. <laughs> These are like, things that have happened. Ugh. Stories that have happened. Well, and I, I guess it's worth repeating this story that the uh, this guy was the president of Century Twenty One, and he was knee deep in garbage in a landfill in Cambodia. Cambodia. And he receives a call from one of the actresses he was working for, and he'd set up a golf stream floor for her. It's a private jet, had it all decked out. He gets a phone call, so he picks up his cell phone, literally knee deep in garbage, with people who are living in the dump. They live in the garbage dump, and he's over there trying to help, doing philanthropy. And this actress calls him just beside herself that one little thing was missing inside the plane for her comfort and convenience. And she says, literally, my life was never meant to be this hard. And that's when he knew, like, I'm done. <laughs> I'm <laughs> out. Done working with these and, people. And so he quit that and then went over there and, and did some, some humanitarian stuff over there. But it was, it was a great reminder. It's easy for all of us to lose that kind of perspective. And we find ourselves complaining. We go to a full pantry or full fridge and... Like, ah, there's nothing to eat in this house. Yeah. Like, oh my goodness, give me a break. Or, well, or things become 
they seem very hard. And oh, one thing I love to say is like, it only seems hard because you are soft. Mm-hmm. Right. And comfort and convenience can make you soft, which then makes things seem hard. Yeah. Well, even when um, COVID hit, like, you know, before we went into quarantine, for me, this is funny, I knew things were getting serious and getting hard and challenging when my Walmart delivery stopped working the way it had been working. <laughs> And I'm like, what is going on here? I can't order. There's no open slots. When I do order, it's late. Like, what is happening? My Walmart delivery, you know? Because you get so used to certain things operating the way they've grown and developed to operate with comfort and ease and convenience. And again, we're striving for... I said it again. We're striving for that because it does make the world a better place. But then... If you're not careful, it's easy to be like, this is crap. I'm not putting up with this grocery delivery service, <laughs> right? It's making my life so hard. Exactly, right. And so we lose perspective. Therefore, we enjoy the, the new systems, the improvements, the progress, because it can make our lives significantly better. And, and more and productive and more um, fulfilling. That's where I was going to go. Oh, okay. No, you're right. Because then we're more productive, we're more fulfilled. But now we have more capacity to do more good, to serve more, to lift more, to build more, to be more, which is, is awesome. It's just got this underlying problem of weakness. And it comes out, I, I get to see this a lot because we do a lot of coaching and I love pushing my own limits, whether it's adventure racing or this humanitarian organization I'm now volunteering with. And these guys push hard, really hard. And for me, it's... I was talking to somebody about, about fitness. And I think, it was with, I think it was with Kaya, our oldest daughter. And we were talking about fitness. And I was talking about, well, I want, I, I want to strive for what, what I call... What's called functional fitness. It's fitness that you can use. It's usable. It actually benefits your life where... I mean, you could, you could build some muscles or something, and it looks good and great, but it's not real usable if you had to get in that situation, which, again, here's a problem, right, is our lives are so easy, so comfortable, so convenient right now. Most of us are like, I don't have any need for functional right. fitness. Right, what do I need to be able to run a mile yeah. or... Or carry someone. To what are you referring, sir? Yes. I have to carry myself to my, my new Tesla. And drive myself to the grocery store. I don't even go to the grocery store anymore because somebody delivers my food. Right. Right. So we do. We live in a time where functional fitness seems to be... Obsolete. Obsolete, yeah. It's just not a necessary. And you're like, oh, yeah, there could be some catastrophe, but that's not likely to happen. And so, well, I'm not going to worry about it. I, I take a, like a holistic approach, a whole life approach to... This idea of functional fitness, meaning it's functional mental fitness, functional spiritual fitness, functional relationship, marriage fitness, parenting fitness. Like I'm taking those ideas and and going the whole spectrum of life and like I, I want to be functionally fit, so to speak, in every important area of life. And And I operate in a world that I see that the necessity for it all the time. Mm-hmm. All the time. And it's so relevant to me. And I get that some of you live lives so that you're like, this, this is completely irrelevant. My concern is that that's just because, and you and I talk about this all the time, we reference the fourth turning. In the third turning, everything's like this. It's just... Comfortable, yeah, easy, easy, convenient. convenient. Like, there's no troubles. Like, what are you talking about? Why would I need to be prepared because everything's great. And if, if it were to continue on in ease and comfort, great. But what if it stops? That's when a crisis hits and people come undone. Well, because as we're talking through this idea, one of the challenges of the comforts that we have created, and I'm saying we in general, like humanity, 
um, that for most people, and, and again, we're, talk, we're talking about the Western world here, because we do realize that there's still developing countries that have not obtained those same levels of comfort and luxury and convenience. But in the Western world, we have obtained these levels of comfort. And in order for, I read some comparison. I can't remember exactly what it is, but I'm going to try and, and put it out here. That for the average person to enjoy the level of comfort and ease they have now is so comparatively easy to do that it makes us soft and weak. I mean, it used to be that if you were going to enjoy the comfort we have, right, you've got temperature control, you know, the equivalent of that, you know, back in Roman times or whatever, running water, essentially servants or slaves to do, because that's what energy is, you know, in The Rational Optimist, he talks about that. For the average person to enjoy the level of life that they do now, a family of four, to have the electricity that they have, the um, food that they have, the clothing that they have, they would need to have like, was it 400 slaves? Yeah, I think it was 400 slaves. 400 sa slaves for a family of four. So we're producing a lot of, we're using, let's say we're consuming, a lot of energy to enjoy the comforts that we have. But we don't have to do a lot of work to do that. I mean, the average person can get a minimum wage job to pretty much maintain most of these comforts. You could have electricity and you can have running yeah. water and you could have a nice couch to sit on from a Goodwill store My and goodness, you, you could have all the clothes you need. Yeah, you can have internet and a smartphone yeah. and, and hot water. And hot water. And a nice bed. With a minimum wage job. So yeah. it's really not that difficult compared to what it used to be, that you used to have to have all of these slaves or all of these other people doing work for you to produce these luxuries and comforts, you know? So the downside of that is that it seems so easy. We're not going to starve. We're not going to freeze to death. We're not going to die of heat stroke. We're not going to go naked. All we have to do is work our minimum wage job, and then the rest of the time we get to watch yeah, Netflix. I guess. Or Amazon it? Prime. You know, it, it's so easy to not die exactly there it is <laughs> it's easy to not die that we don't have to push ourselves and be challenged in order to survive let alone thrive right the the fact that i could become super fat and lazy and do the bare minimum and, and not, not die, die is astounding to me. Yeah. And and it's a it's an indicator of how just how comfortable convenient and easy uh, our lives have become. So the question is, and again, I'm, I can't I don't know the future. The question is, will that level of, level of comfort and convenience continue or if it's disrupted, will those who have become soft and weak just get wrecked? My suspicion is if I understand history right and the, the pattern repeats itself, this is just a temporary thing. And it will come back again. We'll come back to it. But there's going to be some hard times. Whether, and whether it's individual or family or community or nationally or whatever, there's going to be some hard times. When hard times come, soft people suffer. suffer. Or to see it visually your softness will just be dashed to pieces against the hardness of the times. Ooh, I'm thinking through this out loud. Soft people get crushed by hard times. And, and essentially the point we're making is that our comforts today tend to make us softer rather than strong. Right. It's just the natural byproduct of the comforts. It's like when you're pursuing, obtaining those comforts, the actual process of it, that strengthens you. It strengthens you to be in the pursuit of obtaining comforts. But when you have comforts and you're comfortable and you don't feel that need to pursue, well, survival and then some thriving there, you know, 
more of the comfort and luxury and ease, then you're left stagnating. You're, you're simply existing without a threat of imminent danger. Or death. Yeah. Yeah, and so that, for most of us, that's been removed. This threat, and, and so the kind of the default response is, well, why should I keep striving? Why should I be uncomfortable? Why should I push? Why should I try harder? Like, it's not like I'm going to die. And, and that, that's it. I think that's happening. Nah. It's true. <laughs> you're like, yeah, you're, okay, yeah, you're right. And I guess I just want to invite you to think about this differently, to pursue the increase of your capacity. Which kind of brings us back to what the topic is supposed to be that we haven't exactly talked about yet, is handling pressure. And even pursuing it. And even pursuing pressure. Because you want All to All of that increase. was kind of like this introduction of why this would matter. Why would you... Well, you know, we kind of see the point of handling pressure. Like, oh, I've got a lot of going on. I need to handle pressure. But this idea of pursuing pressure, why, why would you want to do that? And it ties into this idea of because we don't have the survival instinct anymore, we're not trying to survive, we have to create or generate this drive that keeps us, that gives us an edge in a way. Mm-hmm. It's kind of what it is. It's giving us a, an edge for any potential <laughs> challenges. Right. Because the, when the time to perform has arrived, the time to prepare has passed. And I would say it Pressure also... Pressure helps us prepare. Ooh, I like that. I like that a lot. I would also say that it gives us the power to take advantage of opportunities that we might otherwise miss if we weren't pursuing pressure. I want to pursue pressure. I guess it has to be proactive. I, like, I really like that word and that idea in this context. I want to proactively pursue pressure so that I can increase my capacity. Now, in my mind's eye, I can... I can imagine some of you being like, hey, look, I got enough pressure. I, I got this, I, all these kids. I got my, my spouse. I got this job. I, all these demands. I, I got too much. I, why would I pursue more? Like, I'm just drowning as it is. And I love to think and ask myself, like, what if I were, what if I was twice as capable as I am right now? Would, would this current load be drowning me? Would it be, be a lot of pressure? And the answer is no. If I were twice as capable then I would be carrying this load with relative ease. And for me, I, I guess not everybody operates like this, but for me, I'm like, why, why wouldn't I do that? Why wouldn't I deliberately increase my capacity so that I can handle more? I don't necessarily, necessarily have to fill it, but it, it's there. It's, I'm building up reserves so I can help other people, so I can take advantage of other opportunities. It's not just like, there's death around the corner, be ready. I mean, that's, that's <laughs> nice too, right? If there is an emergency, and emergencies come to all of us. I just heard another story this morning. Like, we, we, we all go along through life. Nobody's going along, that's going to happen, that's going to happen. We all think it's not going to happen. But man, when it comes knocking at your door, I want to be ready for anything. But whether that's an emergency or a threat or an opportunity, when an opportunity comes knocking, I'm like, yeah, I got space because I've been working on it. Right. I've been working on me. Mm-hmm. And so I'm going to pursue pressure. And, and I do this with education. Rachel and I, before the recording, we were talking about she and I are, are reading these books from the beginning of literature forward in order. Chronologically. Chronologically with, with novel and poetry and novels. And it, it's fun. It's enjoyable. We're pursuing like this, you know, higher level collegiate education and we're not even in college and we're in our 40s with you know our our raising our whole family we're pursuing that i just went and did an excruciatingly physically painful weekend so i could be better 
for fun. I was playing with my friends in the woods. And do you know what I love? He came home and was telling our teens last night, you just got back last night, and you're telling our boys, and they're saying... I was just describing oh, how grueling it was in all three of them. Man, sounds fun. Yeah. Wish I was there. Gosh, I wish I would have gone. I, I want to do that. It was awesome. Yeah. And that's another reason to do it. And if, if that, in fact, were the only reason to do it, it would be to model for your children how to pursue growth and do it with a phenomenal attitude. Just to go things, do things that are so hard, you are not quite sure you can actually do them. Mm -hmm. And your kids are like, oh, dad, can I come next time? Mm -hmm. Like that is, that's thrilling to me. That's exciting. Yeah. That's a big win when they want to do it. And, and sometimes it's for some achievement. Sometimes you go do a big race. Sometimes you go after a big project. You write your book, whatever it is. And sometimes it's just for the sake of doing it. Mm -hmm. just for the sake of exploring your limitations and seeing where you might expand them so you don't live under your limits. Right. Yeah, so a couple things. One of them is, well, as an example, you know, you're talking about doing things just to do them. You take cold showers pretty much every day, I think, and you do that just because... You've read the science behind it and how good it is for you and all the stuff. And so and that's because just it's hard something. To do. And because it's hard to do. And you intentionally do it because it is hard to do. You don't enjoy taking a cold shower. You do it because it's hard. Well, I've already seen that play out so many times where when the time to perform has arrived, the time to prepare has passed. You've prepared your body to be able to handle things because... You take cold showers. And so even on this last weekend, you had an experience where you needed that ability to be in cold water. And you thrived. I, I was and stoked. And rocked it. Because I was sweating and I was sore. I'm like, jump in the cold water and go, please. Like, <laughs> let me in. Where And others jumped in as well. And they, they were instantly shivering. And, and yeah. so, can, catch their breath. <laughs> and they're like, I'm back in the boat because this is miserable. And I was literally in the water like... This is refreshing and awesome. Because I'm glad had, I'm in the water. Yeah, you had trained your body to be able to handle that. And so I think that's a perfect example. Um, but I was also thinking that, you know, because we're talking about, oh, pursuing pressure. And you were saying, well, why would I want to do that? I already have all of these things. And what I thought of was maybe it's not even pursuing pressure per se, as in taking on something different or more or whatever, but it could also be this idea of opting in to the pressure because um, Jordan Peterson has this, I don't know, I mean, I've heard it several times in different podcasts, but he talks about from a clinical psychologist perspective, the power that comes when people opt into their challenges as opposed to feeling like they're imposed, opposed to them feeling like they're imposed upon them. That's beautiful. That when you feel like your pressure is imposed on you and you have no say, all you do you is have resist no choice, it and resent it. It actually becomes very detrimental to yeah. you. It's it's stressful in a negative, a bad way. It's anxiety producing, like all of these negative things. Where if you have opted into that pressure, it changes everything and it actually becomes a positive for you instead of a negative. Because you operate from a place of, I choose this. Exactly. So it could just be that. It could just be switching your mindset. If you already have all of these things, well, switch your mindset about it and say like, yeah, I choose this. And if there are things that you wouldn't choose, well, then find a way to eliminate them if possible. You know what I mean? Yep. Or at the very least say, well, I don't choose this, but it needs to be done. So I'm choosing so, to do it. Yep, exactly. I wouldn't choose this. I don't like it. But if it needs to be done, if there's value here or, or there's no way around it, then I choose this. Which is what happens mentally for you with the whole idea of like a cold shower. You know of its benefits and there's, you know, anyone can go study the research behind cold water therapy. You know the benefits. And so even though you don't like doing it, like it's sometimes painful for me how much you don't like doing it because you'll go to get in the cold shower and I'm like, oh... This is hard. Don't do it, babe. Just take a warm shower. <laughs> It'll be so much more enjoyable, you know. But you do it because you know it trains your mind to be able to do those difficult things 
when you need to do them. Yep. And I have seen you be able to handle those situations so many times, saving people's lives, carrying people off mountains, like all of these stories, because you've trained yourself to just do what needs to be done when you say it needs to be done. Yep. And that, having experienced that firsthand and having been in... We, our life is unbelievable. <laughs> the stories we have are... They are unbelievable. Insane. Like, like you wouldn't... If I hadn't lived them, I'd be like, no way, man. You're making that how, up. How can that keep happening <laughs> again and again and again? But there, there are so many times where it has paid off. I, I can't question it. I can't doubt it. I can't dismiss it. Deliberately choosing pressure has prepared us to be a great force for good in the world in so many ways. And it actually makes life easier and more enjoyable. So big things get smaller as you and I grow. Mm, yeah. But if we atrophy, little things become big. Yeah. And now life's, oh, life's so hard. Oh, this is happening. Where if we're growing and we're, we're tightening up those spiritual, mental, social, financial, physical muscles, you know, yeah, this isn't so bad. Let's work right around this. And do it cheerfully. Mm-hmm. That's, that's where I, you know, I got to a place in my journey through this. And I can, I can look back now over the last, I don't know, 30 years. And I can see this process of opting in. Yeah. Well, well first you're like, this sucks. Why me? <laughs> like this whole big pity party. Oh, it's miserable, terrible. I don't want anything to do with this. To opting in saying, okay, this sucks. What are you going to do about it? Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something about it. And then progressively up to, ooh, I'm going to choose to do something absolutely miserable. And I commit, fully commit to myself to be cheerful the entire time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, as you're talking, I'm thinking about kind of the way we have approached life. And we've... We even did a podcast about it, talking about choosing your challenges and this concept that a lot of times what happens with people is they go through life kind of, um, um, I don't know, they're not actively engaged. Right. They're kind of just holding, sitting around, waiting for life to happen to them Yep. in a way. Instead of actively pursuing life. And when they do that, when they're kind of just living life and letting it happen, it's interesting how we've observed and experienced that things happen to you to cause you to be challenged, right? Maybe it's sickness or or disease or an injury or an accident or bad things, these trials, these hard hardships that come. And I think that's part of just how life operates, where the other side of that is if you actively pursue challenging things it's like some of those other things fall away they don't even happen because you're still being challenged but it's in a way that you've opted in to do it's it's the challenge that comes from pursuing something that you want and I think about even right now where we are in our life we're in the middle of packing like we have a box right here we're packing actively right now to move to Portugal but on the way to Portugal we're going to go travel for a few months not just go travel <laughs> I'm driving okay to Guatemala with In my boys days. and then we're we're leading two trips to Norway, and then we're taking a train well, trip. Well, before that, of... you're doing a, a humanitarian trip. Oh, yeah, then I'm doing another training in Central before America Before we go again. to Norway. <laughs> and then after our two Norway trips, we're going to travel by train to the goal is 15 countries. We'll right. see how many we make before our visa runs out. Um, but across Europe, through Scandinavia, the, the Baltic, and then into Western Europe. There's a lot of logistics that go into planning all of this. And in the meantime, we're also selling our house and selling all of our vehicles and transporting everything we want to take from here to Portugal. And, you know, there's like 
all of these moving pieces. Like I, There's a lot of moving pieces. And so part of it is, I'm trying to say that it's not easy. It's challenging. It's really difficult. It's not difficult in a, like, you know, something bad happened to me, I lost someone. It's not difficult in that kind of way, but it is difficult and challenging in that it requires your mind, your heart, your energy, your emotion. All of these things are involved that you have to be able to manage and direct and use and and keep going. You can't give up, you know, like all of these, all of the things that we think of when we're dealing with a challenge or a trial, all of that's involved, but it's a it's involved in a different way. It's this proactive instead of reactive way. And so it's hard, quote unquote, but it's hard in a different way. And then it's interesting how then, you know, when you might be tempted to complain about like, oh, this is so hard because I've been packing for days and this and that and, the other and, and all, this went wrong and this happened and this. Your mindset changes about it because you're like, well, I chose this. I opted in to do this. I want to do this thing. And this is what's required to get there. And so, okay, I just have to figure it out and solve the problem. And so back to that whole idea with, you know, what Jordan Peterson's talking about, that when you opt in for those challenges, it's like it increases your your capacity in a way yep. because you are active instead of Proactive instead of reactive. And it, it alters your experience. Yeah. Just that one little shift in your mind. Yeah. But this is going to sound a little strange, but what if, because God and the universe are constantly conspiring in our favor, and they know what's best for us, what if there's an equation that we just Scales. need to be challenged? Yeah. That we need to balance out. Yeah. And either either you choose them, or they're chosen for you. Yeah, Exactly. I know that sounds crazy, but just sit with it for a little bit. I've been I've been chewing on that one for decades. Mm-hmm. I remember somebody saying that to me right after, shortly after you and I were married. This guy, he was a just a phenomenal teacher, but he was also in the special forces. And he said that he said, you know, he's like I've observed that when people really chase challenge, he says that they seem to have fewer trials. Mm-hmm. And I remember uh, we were just in our early twenties, and I remember thinking, "Well, that's, that's that seems a little weird, bro. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's kind of a weird statement." But I've been chewing on that for literally two decades. Yeah. And it seems like if if the if there exists an equation that we grow because of difficulty, then why not opt in and even pursue it in a healthy way? This isn't like you're not a martyr and you're not, you know, you're not in an unhealthy balance where you're sacrificing other important things. You're just, you're pursuing your own growth for the right reasons, the right thing for the right reasons that really add value to your life and the people around you. And you're doing it cheerfully. And some of you might be tempted to think, well, I can't do that. No, no way. To which I say, you could totally do it. You just have to, we have to want it and then commit to it. Mm-hmm. So I guess the invitation today is, well, opt in. Opt into what you're facing. We did that. <laughs> well, this came up a lot when we were traveling with little kids and it was hard. It was, and it was hard on me because I was like physically was carrying mm-hmm. kids and stuff and things and sometimes there was just chaos and mayhem and border crossings and airport, all this stuff. And and it was like, oh, man, this is you brutal. Were a pack mule. But I remember thinking the same thing. We chose this. Yeah. Like, this is what we wanted. And so I switched my mind way back then. I'm like, no. And this, is always, this has been a discussion point between the two of us for a long time. Because I was like, oh, yeah, well, yeah, all that rough stuff, that... That's just part of the process so that we can enjoy this amazing experience of traveling together. Because I just flipped my mindset back then. I'm like, okay, yeah, the pressure here of getting all this done so that we can have these memories together. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. And I just switched that in my mind. Like, yeah, I chose this pressure. Let's lean into it. And what's happened 
to us and to our children, which is so exhilarating to me, is you, you rise with the pressure. Mm-hmm. And then you seek it out, which amplifies the rising. Yeah. And so you become more capable more competent, and therefore more confident. And it makes for a really great life. Yeah, it does. And I'm saying that with all sincerity while I'm sitting here in pain. (laughs) Right. Yeah, it's not a challenge-free life, but it's a different type of challenge. We, It's hard, but it's a different type of hard. Mm -hmm. It's not hard like what people are used to. Like It's not hard and miserable. It's hard and... Inspiring or motivating or... Or fun even. Like this weekend, it was hard and fun. Yeah. It was hard and fulfilling. It's definitely more fulfilling. Yeah. Um, while we're talking about this, I kind of want to make a distinction though because I think sometimes people equate what we're talking about with some sort of forcing things to happen. They will get some idea or some, you know, they're like, I'm going to choose this thing. I'm going to do this. And then they try to make it happen in a way that actually becomes toxic or detrimental or they have to sacrifice the wrong things. Or I even remember... Okay, what sticks out for me is this story of when we were newly traveling. You know, this was back in like 2007. And, well, this house we talked about on the hill. The one that was like almost 7,000 square feet. We had been living in another house that was lower down the hill, but it was a comfortable house. It was a nice house. And for some reason, I got obsessed with the idea of living in this bigger house. And it was to the point where I was going to make this happen no matter what. Right? And we did, but here's the interesting thing. It wasn't supposed to happen. And within a month or two, the stock market crashed. Right? It was, 2000, it was almost 2008. The stock market crashed. We lost all of our income. We ended up having to leave Costa Rica and going back. And I think in some ways it might have been, one of the reasons we might have had to leave is because we moved into this house that was a lot more expensive for us at the time. And part of it was because I had forced that to happen. Like I'm like, I want this to happen. I need this to happen. It must happen. That's not the right way to approach it. And I contrast it to now um, this trip that we're planning, this move that we're planning to Portugal. The way it's come about has been so serendipitous, so inspired, guided, directed, that it's not something we're forcing to happen. Now, that doesn't mean there's not work and challenge involved in making it happen. That's required. But it's not done in a way that's forcing something to happen that's maybe not in your best interest. I, it's hard for me to really articulate those ideas that I'm mm-hmm. talking about, but it's something I've definitely experienced. You know, for just one example of how this whole train trip idea came about was we'd already been planning a trip to Norway, which that was its own separate thing that came about that way. And then when after the trip was over, we were going to just spend a couple weeks in Norway in a cabin. And you were, when I shared that idea or picked out some places, you were like, we're going to be bored to death. What are we going to do for two weeks in a cabin in the woods, you know? And that's when we're like, maybe we should do this and go here and go here. And all of us just came alive with excitement. Like we were all enthused with that thought. Now, it was also terrifying because we were like, I don't know if we can do that or yeah, is it we even can possible? afford it or if it's even possible. But it was a creative, like, mind-storming uh, session. Yeah. Where everyone was like, whoa, what about this? What about that? Right. Let's explore this. What, is this possible? Yeah, and so that's kind of the idea behind this idea of pursuing challenge. It's a challenge to make something like that happen. 
but it was a challenge that was inspiring and enlivening. Mm -hmm. We were drawn to it. Not, not that kind of low state, dark, I deserve this suffering, yeah. beat me. Well, there, throughout or even, history, there's been those religious yeah. zealots. Or you want to whip yourself who, because... Who literally beat themselves or have other beat, beat them because, uh, you know, I'm enduring my I cross. I need to, right. I need to Be suffer. Be challenged and suffer. Yeah. Or as opposed to like with the, um, our house in Costa Rica, I know for me, there was a lot of, it might have been comparison because there were a lot of expats, you know, in the area and they were living a, living the life and I'm like, I need to be a part of this and I need to show it. It was the wrong reasons, you know, not that living in a big house is wrong or bad, but at the time, my reason for wanting that was off. We didn't need a huge house. We only had like four little kids, you know. So it was it was the motivation behind it that was wrong and off as opposed to that inspiring motivation that's directing you towards your potential. Yeah. If that makes sense. There's so many little nuances here too mm -hmm. that, that relate to that. Another one that I've seen recently is like sometimes you get this fixed idea in your head of I'll never quit, I'll never quit, I'll never quit, I've finished something. Mm -hmm. And yet that's... That's not always the case. Right. Sometimes, Sometimes you get you going down quit. the wrong road and you're like, bro, you need to quit. Yeah. And you need to quit now. The The best time to quit was way back when you first realized now is like, right now is the next best time right. to realize you have got to quit. And you think, no, but I never quit. I never quit. I'm, I'm like, quitting. no. Like, stop. You're just going down the wrong path mm -hmm. farther than you should. And yeah. so there's, there's things like that where you're like, no, there's definitely a time to quit. There's definitely a time to change directions. There's definitely a time to readjust what you're doing. Yeah. But, but the whole idea is here, and, and the invitation, and just so, so just chew on this for the next uh, few days, few weeks, few decades, like really think through, like, how am I going to embrace challenge? Where do I want to pursue some pressure? Where would I like to focus some pressure with the intent for growth? preparation and progress and you might put put certain areas of your life through an imaginary stress test uh, the spiritual side the financial side the relationship side the mental toughness just go do something pick pick some things pick some events throw something on the calendar that i, I kept telling rachel i'm like i feel very excited and very nervous mm -hmm. for this thing because i knew how hard it was going to be i love having things on the calendar like that right i'm looking forward to something that's that's going to be exciting, and it's going to be hard. Mm -hmm. I know a little bit what to expect, and on the other side, I have no idea what to expect. Yeah, that's how I like to have my calendar. And in and same thing applies with you know this train trip we're planning. It's the same sort of idea. There's a lot of unknowns. Yep. We're also going to be trying to work from the road and do pot. Just before this podcast, we're discussing the logistics of doing a podcast on the road, right? Like, okay, we're in a hotel in Lithuania. How are we going to do the podcast? What microphones do we need? And what we have to work through all of those details and think about those things and plan ahead so that we can take it with us. Because otherwise, if we, you know, we can't necessarily buy it there. We don't know. Maybe we could, maybe we can't. So it's all of these unknowns that we're trying to navigate, which can be intimidating. And that's what stops people usually they just don't know how to figure that out or how to sort through all of that. And yet the only way to really do that is to opt in, to choose it and say, okay, let's, let's go. Let's try and figure this out. Let's move ahead and solve the obstacles as they come. That is such a profound imagery in my head right now where somebody walks up and, and the obstacle standing in front of them is intimidation. So if you mm -hmm. picture this in your mind eye, there's a, there's a boulder, there's some kind of obstacle. Maybe it's even just a small barrier or a gate that says intimidation. And you walk up and, and, and turn around and walk away. Mm -hmm. And the yeah. gate says intimidation where somebody else walks walk up and say, oh, you better open, sucker. <laughs> I'm going to break you down. Yeah. And the intimidation literally opens to you. Yes. Because you're like, I won't be intimidated by you. In fact, I'm going to intimidate you back. <laughs> intimidation. <laughs> and, right. and you move forward. And yeah. it's... it's much as we're kind of fumbling around this idea, trying to articulate what we're thinking and feeling, ultimately you'll sense it and feel it. And life has been so much 
richer and meaningful and gratifying and exciting. Mm -hmm. Exhilarating, literally. Yeah. Because we have chosen to embrace the pressure mm -hmm. in every aspect of our lives. And so we want to and that, extend that, that invitation to you. Sorry, and that carries over to our kids because because we've all opted into taking this journey and we're all excited about that, that makes all the work we have to do easier to do and easier to get the kids on board with doing it because they realize what we're working There's towards, purpose you know? and we, relevance. We have, we're, we're showing our house because we're selling it and so sometimes we get a message saying, we want to see your house in 15 minutes. And so we all run around like crazy cleaning it up and getting it ready. But they're all opting in to do that. And they're not complaining because they realize what it's for. Yeah. They're like, okay, if we want to go to Europe, we got to sell this house. So we're all going to clean up as fast as we can so we can make that goal happen. Yeah, this is awesome. Okay, get after it. Um, you guys, if you haven't subscribed to the podcast, do that. L leave a review. Uh, if, you, if you liked it, uh, ask us a question, reach out, connect with us on social, and share this with friends and family and colleagues, and then get something on your calendar today. I would take, take the next couple of days to think about this and write some ideas down, talk to your spouse and your family, your kids, and draft your calendar. Put, put something on the calendar. Here's, here's a little invitation. Maybe in the next 24 to 48 hours, put something on your calendar and, and in, your, in your plan, in your mind, all of it. Get it in there that's that's going to increase either increase the pressure or just opt into the pressure where you just say it's i'm, I'm, I'm flipping i'm flipping the switch here on how i approach this and watch watch what watch what it starts to do in your life and it'll trickle over and kind of cascade into other areas of your life where you just start pushing and pursuing and man life gets better and better love you guys thanks for listening reach up with Oh, 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 oh,